Even if you have a smartphone, you may not be using the app. So we do have the paper option available if that's more comfortable for you. So if you'd like to have a question for one of the panelists, please write it on a piece of paper. We have some papers available. Where are our volunteers? Our volunteers for the session are here in the back. So if you'd like to write down a question, you're not using the application, just put up your hand during the session. They will pass you a piece of paper. You can write your question on the paper. Alternatively, you can put the question in the app and we'll get those to the session chairs. So the volunteers will deliver the questions to the session chairs, the session chairs will review them, and then we'll ask the questions to the panelists at the end of the session. So is that, is that clear to everybody? So we're not gonna have questions from the pub public with the microphone, they're all going to the chairs, the chairs will ask the questions, okay? So thank you very much. If you have any questions about the app, feel free to contact us, and I hope you really enjoy the session, thanks. Thank you, Emily. Good morning. I'd like to introduce Mr. Victor Vega. Victor received a bachelor degree in geology for National University of Columbia in 1989, and master in geophysics and from the University of South Carolina, Colombia in 1993. He has worked in Colombia, Venezuela, and the United States with Amoco BP and the Econ Energy. He currently works in regional exploration managers, South American and Caribbean, with Shell Americans in Houston, Texas. Victor professional affiliation include membership in the Society of Exploration Geophysics, the Colombian Association of Petroleum Geologists and Geophysists, and the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. Victor is a past president of Latin American and Caribbean region and currently serves as advisory counselor for the region and has participated in numerous APC committees. He has now general vice uh, chairs of the current international conference and exhibition, Buenos Aires, 1999. Thank you. Uh, good morning, buenos dias. Welcome to the International Oil Company uh, Forum. Um, we'd like to introduce my co-chair, Carlos uh, Colo, who is also the general chair of the event. So Carlos uh, has a degree in geology from the National University of Patagonia. And he's a graduate, uh, has a graduate degree from the Argentina Business Institute uh, on Business Management Program. Uh, Carlos has uh, four years of uh, EMP experience, all of them with YPF. Uh, he started as exploration geologist, uh, held in, uh, holding uh, numerous positions, including general manager of YPF Colombia, director of the Heras uh, Economic Unit, head of technical direction, executive manager of exploration and development, and the reserves auditor, which is the current position. And he's also serving as the president uh, of ARPEL, which is the regional association of companies in the oil and gas uh, and biofuel sector in Latin America. And he serves also on the academic committee of the postgraduate course in hydrocarbons at the Universidad de La Plata. So we have uh, four uh, presentations today. Let me introduce the first speaker. So, also a couple of announcements that we need to make in case of any evacuation, if necessary, you will hear an announcement broadcast over the public uh, address system use the nearest available emergency exit route to the appropriate assembly point. Our nearest assembly point is at the back corner of the hotel at Olga Consentini on, on Manuela Sainz. Uh, also a reminder that there is no, that the, by APG policy, no photography or audio or video can be captured during the presentations. Uh, so please do not uh, use that. If we see somebody doing that, we're gonna ask them to please uh, not do a review the only person that will do it will be the authorized personnel of the APG. Um, and then also, uh, I think the, the important thing is, is uh, be considered with the speakers and, and turn your cell phone off uh, so that uh, it doesn't get any interference. So the first presenter this morning um, is from ExxonMobil, Eric Oswald. Uh, Eric uh, holds a, a bachelor's degree in geoscience from the University of Washington and a PhD degree in earth sciences from the University, State University of New York at Stony Brook. 
Eric joined ExxonMobil in 1991, has held a variety of technical and managerial positions in research, production, and exploration. He started as a research uh, scientist and then worked in the Middle East Division, West Africa, Caspian regions. And in 2008, he became the Middle East manager, area manager. And in July of 2009, uh, transitioned to a region's operations manager role in Europe and Greenland, based in London. Uh, Eric was appointed uh, as VP of uh, Business Development for Exxon in 2011. And in May 2014, he was appointed Vice President Americas of Exxon Mobile Exploration Company. And currently, he is Vice President Exploration and New Ventures America for Exxon Upstream Business Development uh, Company. He has uh, professional memberships, including APG, SPE, Geological Society of London, and he's on the National Ocean Institute Association uh, Board of Directors. So welcome, Eric, and thanks for being here. Good morning. Buenos dias. Thanks, Victor. Thank you to APG and YPF for having us here, the opportunity to talk to you all. This morning, I want to talk about exploration. I want to talk about why it's important to you, how it's important to Argentina, and how it's important to the world. So we're going to cover a lot of ground. Um, and I'm going to start off with Argentina with this beautiful picture I have up behind me here. Uh, the company's been in Argentina for almost 100 years. We came in in 1911. Um, and fortunately, when I started work in this part of the world, uh, it was right as we were drilling the first exploration wells for the company in the Neoken. In fact, uh, we drilled a very successful Baja de Choiki long lateral horizontal, which was one of the big producers. Um, in fact, the first time I've seen the word superposo written before. And that's what really got the company excited about investing in, in the Neoken, in the unconventionals here. And of course, as you all know now, um, that was the beginning of establishing, establishing this as a truly world-class, unconventional resource. So that's been a big part of our business here, and we continue to invest. I think we're up to about $850 million of investment and, uh, and looking for more. We also uh, got some offshore acreage in this last very successful tender round, uh, along with a number of other companies here. And so that's, uh, that's good news. That's another reason for me to come to Argentina and very exciting. So I, you know, bottom line is the geology is telling us to invest in Argentina. There's an incredible unconventional resource. There's exciting exploration opportunities offshore. And the rocks are saying, come, come and, in, come and invest here. Of course, the challenges are uh, above the ground. And uh, that's something that I think all of us as, as investors are, are constantly looking at uh, to make sure that we've got the right investment uh, climate to, to be investing. In particular, you know, we, we support the transition that they're making to market-driven prices, but any kind of substantial investment here in Argentina is really going to require security of oil and gas offtake with creditworthy buyers and market-related prices. And I think if we can get that under control, uh, there's, there's plenty more investment that uh, we can make it here in, in Argentina. Okay, so let's turn a little bit more globally because this investment question is a big global issue. Uh, over the next two decades, um, we expect the global population to grow by about 30%, so from about 7 to 9 billion people on the planet. GDP will double during that time, and the middle class will nearly double. So three to five billion people in the middle class um, by 2040. So that has huge implications for energy. And you can see on these charts here, a way of looking at that energy demand is to just look at the oil and gas part of it, uh, which that demand for energy will increase by about 25% uh, by 2040. That's the equil equivalent of adding another North America and Latin America to the energy mix. So it's a huge increase in the amount of energy that the world will require. And when you just look at the oil and gas needed, uh, that's a substantial portion of that energy increase. And you hear a lot of discussion about what these, these demand curves look like. Um, but the real issue is when you factor in decline in both oil and gas. And when you look at decline, you see that you have a lot of work to do to bring new supply to the world. That's about 8% a year for oil and about 6% a year for, for gas. So that creates an enormous opportunity space that we know we're going to be working in 
for quite some time um, to try to deliver that, that oil and gas to the world. Um, just so you know, the, the curves that you're seeing here are completely aligned with Paris Agreement uh, numbers, you know, the commitments that the governments have made. And then there's also a, a, a diamond on there that shows this two degree case if you develop some sort of new technology that could get you to a two degree case. So you should see even in those, in those really extreme cases, there's still an enormous amount of oil and gas that needs to be um, brought to the markets uh, to supply the world's needs. Another way of looking at that is um, by just looking at the estimated amount of oil and gas that's required, and these curves are kind of daunting. You can see something like 555 billion barrels of oil that we need to bring to market and 2,100 trillion cubic feet of gas uh, that, need, that we need to bring to bear. So a huge amount of work ahead, um, and that means that a lot of money needs to be invested in oil and gas. The IEA um, estimates something like $21 trillion of oil and gas investment ne is needed by 2040. $21 trillion. If you kind of break that down by current production, that means ExxonMobil should be spending 30 to $35 billion a year just to keep pace with that kind of investment. And uh, we're spending a lot of money, but we're not spending quite that much money. So this kind of gets me to one of the central points I want to make is that uh, one of the biggest issues going on in the energy space right now is uh, a very serious underinvestment in oil and gas development. And as, as you all know, this is not something you catch up on quickly. Once you get behind in here, it's a long-term business. And so the die is being cast right now for something that will play out in five to ten years with uh, little recourse to correct it at that time, just because we can't, you know, turn on five million a day in, uh, in oil. So these investments are critical, and that's the conversation that we need to be having. One sort of final summary chart to look at this uh, demand, you can see, if you look at the decline of existing um, resources that we have for oil in blue there, and then all those gray wedges are various degrees of development, and the hashered wedge at the top is is undiscovered stuff that we still need to find. So the way I look at this as an explorer is it's not just that hashered stuff that I'm going after. I know I need to find that, uh, that oil and gas, but I also need to find things that are going to displace those developing resources out of the queue. So in my company, you know, my job is to try to displace things and bring more profitable investment opportunities in. So my, my space is really everything above the blue um, that I can work in. And I think that's true of industry as well. There's a lot of uh, projects that could be displaced by higher quality exploration projects coming in. Just a final note here, this demand sensitivity line, that dashed line that you see there, for those of you that are electric car aficionados, that's the scenario where all of the cars in the world are electric cars by 2040. Okay, so you can still see, even in that scenario, we're producing about as much oil as we are today. And that scenario is pretty challenging because that would essentially require that all electric cars being sold in the world today would be electric. And we're a little bit behind that pace. Okay, so we talked about the global demand. Now I want to talk a little bit about uh, the portfolio. And any investment opportunity that you work in that has less than a 50-50 chance of of panning out um, requires you to deal with a portfolio. You know, you're not gonna win with those kind of odds unless you've got a number of swings um, to, to make your investments. So a lot of what we do in exploration is trying to strengthen the portfolio of the, of the company. And ExxonMobil does that in a variety of ways. We're very big on counter-cyclical investment, so one of the primary things we try to do is invest in exploration year, on, year in, year out. And, uh, and take advantage of the, the, the cycles. That's worked out pretty well for us in, in Guyana, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, but we've hit a, a low cost cycle while we're investing heavily in the country, and that, that helps the investment um, quite a lot. So the key with strengthening this portfolio is making sure 
that you've got a, a good spread of opportunities. We're in all the major resource types in LNG and unconventional and deep water, spread across those, and then um, geographic diversity so that you're not undermined by political events in any one uh, particular country. That portfolio analysis is, is key to our upstream deal. And as I said before, we're constantly comparing what new opportunities look like relative to things that are discovered and we're making decisions about development. So that's the active portfolio management that's going on in the, in the country. And then if you're not gonna develop it, you sell it and, and get it out the door. Here's a way of looking at that. We use a number of uh, metrics when we're doing that sort of analysis. This one shows um, break-even price. It's a, it's a way of looking at cost of supply. And the point I want to make here is, you know, the best of the Permian stuff probably comes in a little bit below $40. Um, and there's a range in all that West Texas unconventional. But the point I want to make here is that there's significant amounts of expiration running room that comes in below break-even prices on those excellent West Texas unconventional opportunities. So there's plenty of space for the explorer to play in the conventional or deep water realm. And, uh, and as an example, we've been successful doing that in Guyana, but there's, you know, there's plenty of other areas that are, are coming in, uh, in there. But you can see the challenge that it sets up. So you're not just out looking for barrels, you're looking for barrels that are gonna compete for dollars with uh, the big unconventional investments or the big LNG investments that many of our companies uh, have made. Okay, um, I won't belabor this. We've had a good few years here, so the charts look good, but I wouldn't kid myself. They didn't look this way in the period before that, and I know all these gentlemen over here are working pretty hard to make sure they don't look this way in the next five years, so uh, we've had a good run. I think uh, a little bit of luck, and you know we've done a nice job kind of reframing our exploration program to be a little bit more commercially and politically savvy when we do the analysis. Um, but we've also had a, a good run of luck. So uh, we'll, we'll hope it keeps working out that way. One of the stars of our portfolio is Guyana, so I should probably talk a little bit about that. This is the first FPSO. It's actually sailing, um, sailing on its way. It's, it's uh, sailing, steaming to location uh, to start producing here. So we've you know, come out publicly. We've talked about the amount of oil that we've discovered since the discovery well, and that we're targeting getting three quarters of a million a day going by 2025 with our partner CNOC and, um, and HESS. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit of that story, and I'm gonna just do a quick scene set to, so you know what the neighborhood looks like, um, and I'll, I'll use three time periods to kind of set up the, uh, what the hydrocarbon system's doing here. We'll start off in the early Jurassic. Um, the, there isn't really a basin yet formed off of Guyana, and the conjugate is actually Florida and the Bahamas, which is sort of interesting. Right now we're appraising a, a big discovery we made a few years ago called Ranger. It's a big carbonate buildup, and we're just doing an appraisal well on it right now. And I kind of view that buildup as the southernmost extension of the Bahamas, and they were pretty close together at this point, but then events uh, have put quite a lot of distance between them. So in the late Jurassic, or mid or late Jurassic, that's when we had spreading in the Guyana Basin, and that sort of created seafloor and created space for the uh, hydrocarbon system to develop. And, and actually, it was that insight in the 1990s that got the geologists working off of these plate models to start thinking about a potential hydrocarbon system and got them focused in uh, to go look at uh, prospectivity down in, in Guyana. In the lower Cretaceous, um, you can see we've, we've started to develop that basin. And we've also got South America kind of rotating counter, uh, clockwise now. So as the Atlantic Ocean starts to open up, there's actually compression north of Guyana in the Demerara High, and, and it's an, an equivalent in, in Africa. So that's, that sets up a, a strange uh, sort of compressional tectonic terrain that you see off, offshore on this uh, passive margin. Of course, it gets to be a passive margin as you go into Lake Cretaceous, and that's when these big river systems are draining very quartz-rich sandstones off of the Guyana Shield and giving you the incredible reservoirs that uh, we see out there today, um, which are covered by mudstones that are largely the Amazon River um, moving sediment across there, and that's what gives you burial, um, 
maturation of the, of the ACT source and, uh, and then migration into these largely strat traps um, that are out there. So it's a fascinating area. It's got all kinds of complexity stratigraphically. The seismic is very comp complex when you get down to trying to figure out whether you have hydrocarbons there. Um, and it's, it's really been a lot of fun to work on. It's an amazing story when you look at how the whole thing started because you gotta go all the way back to 1929 for, that's when the first well was drilled in Guyana onshore and dry hole. Um, and they've drilled a lot of dry holes there. We drilled a dry hole in 1978 that was the first deep water well. And, uh, and then I think there's been something like 330 wells, 200 of them dry. So an incredible run of, of dry holes and unsuccessful wells. Uh, something like 39 in the deep water alone in Guyana. So when the folks came in to pitch this prospect in the mid-1990s, and you looked at the hydrocarbon audit here, you can imagine that was a pretty tough sell to management because there's certainly a lot of uh, signs of, of uh, failure. Uh, but fortunately, they were able to uh, go down and talk to the government and get a reasonable contract in place. So that led to uh, kind of a long period of force majeure. They were working on their border with Suriname, so that took about eight years, and we kind of waited patiently for them to get that together, and then uh, started acquiring seismic. Uh, and then finally, in 2015, um, we, we drilled the Lisa well. Interestingly, right after Lisa was discovered, the next best prospect, and I'll show you a, a picture of it here in a second, was a prospect called Skipjack, which looked just fantastic and was a little bigger than Lisa and was completely dry. And I still have nightmares to this day thinking of what would have happened if I drilled that one first rather than Lisa. Um, but after we got by Skipjack, we've had a, a great run. And here, here's a picture of those things right now. So you can see Lisa, the discovery well. Um, and it's, you know, look down at that interval, you'll see those bright spots on the lower part of the well is what we were targeting. And then you look over to Skipjack, and that looks very similar. Um, so it's a pretty humbling, humble, humbling geology. Uh, you'll also see on there Ranger, which is that carbonate buildup I talked about. That's out on the right side of that screen. OK. So um, once, we, once we got after the expiration, you know, the, the, we've had a lot of success. We've, drilled something like 15, 16, maybe 17 wells here. We're, we're in two wells right now. Um, and a pr pretty decent success rate, uh, not just in that Lisa play, but in some other plays too. So I think there's plenty of upside here. Um, there's still a lot of active expiration. We're running two expiration rigs and probably will be for quite a while. Um, so I hope to see that those resource numbers con continue to increase. Probably the most exciting thing though is uh, that we've really gotten after the development stuff and, and so we'll be getting some oil flowing here quickly. Um, talked a little bit about you know, the pre-discovery stuff and working out this hydrocarbon system concept. Uh, it's, it's amazing to look at the original single line that was used and the whole concept you know, was really thought out in 1997. These guys kind of had the, the prospect idea delineated and the source identified um, and just took us a long time to finally get to being able to test the thing, but a lot of credit goes to those geoscientists that worked uh, to set the whole thing up early on. Okay, right after we made the discovery, we went out and shot the, the biggest survey that we had ever shot. I'm, I'm not sure if it was in industry, but it was a very large 3D survey. And that's the survey that we, we saw Skipjack on. So we didn't, we didn't drill Skipjack first because we didn't have 3D over it, thank goodness. <laughs> but uh, this survey has been the one that's really allowed us to go to work in the, in the, in the uh, eastern part of the block. Still have uh, the whole western part of the block to work on. We don't have much seismic data up there right now. Okay, and so that's the Lisa story. Um, Boat steaming on there. We're hoping to get production going. Um, that'll be less than five years after the discovery. So that's something that the developers are, should be real proud of. That's a great thing for the country um, to, to get all that resource going. And, and you, you've seen in the papers, we've got a couple boats lined up to go after that. Finally, I'll just real quickly turn to Brazil because that's, I think, the next really exciting thing that's going on. 
and the big part of my job in the last couple of years has been adding acreage there. Uh, and you can see we've gone from, you know, 2017, you showed that graph there, 2017, in just a couple of years, we've really um, built up the acreage position pretty substantially and have a really exciting um, lineup of drilling. In fact, we'll probably start drilling here late this year and continue exploration drilling for probably two years. So it's going to be a very exciting time. Uh, one way or the other, it's going to be very exciting. And the first prospect out of the block is one of the most exciting prospects that's going to get drilled in the world this year. It's called Urupuru. It's a big carbonate uh, prospect, and there's a line across it. But uh, most likely success case of many, many billions of barrels. So this one will be, we'll be staying up late to watch this one come in. Okay, so that's all I have for you. Um, I think that for us, the key in this exploration deal has been really getting a lot more savvy about the commercial analysis and the political analysis, adding those to what was already a very strong geotechnical uh, way of looking at exploration. And those three things working together has uh, allowed us to do a much better job managing our exploration portfolio and uh, hopefully seeing some more success going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Um, our second presenter, uh, Mark Gerrits uh, from Shell. Uh, Mark uh, joined Shell in Australia as a geologist in 1986, where he has, he, was, he has spanned a variety of exploration roles. With over 30 years of experience and leadership expertise, he has been Vice President uh, of Exploration Asia and Australia, General Manager, Exploration and Board Member for Shell in Libya, Vice President of Strategy and Portfolio Upstream and Integrated Gas. He has also worked uh, in technical and commercial roles in Angola, uh, UK North Sea, and Egypt. And currently, Mark is Executive Vice President of Exploration for Shell since uh, February of 2017. In this role, he has global accountability for exploration uh, operations and new business opportunities worldwide, as well as overseeing all the technical aspects of exploration. Welcome, uh, Mark, and thanks for being here. presentation if that's okay. Let's see. This one. Great. There you go. Good. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Victor, for the uh, introduction there. Uh, great pleasure to be here with you today, folks. Um, thank you very much to the APG for the uh, invitation to join, and uh, thank you all indeed for the uh, interest you're showing by uh, by coming to the session here today. So I plan to talk about two things today. Firstly, I'll describe global energy trends. Uh, Eric touched on that a little bit already, but I'll sort of relate and compare uh, sort of the global trend with what we're seeing in uh, Latin America as a region. And then what I also intend to do is to share Shell's perspective on this, you know, given our long history in the, uh, in, in the region, pretty much 100 years, and what we're doing now and expect to do in the future to address these trends. Um, you know, there's always a risk that we're going to be talking about the same sort of things up here on the stage, so I'm going to try and mix it up a bit by um, using a number of different lenses uh, to characterize the different ventures we're in, in the region, which hopefully you'll find uh, an interesting perspective. Um, sorry. So, f firstly then on the energy challenge. Uh, we're going to hear a lot more about this, I think, later today in the, uh, in the lunch session for those of you attending. But I think it's very clear that society faces a dual challenge of how to make a transition to a low-carbon energy future, you know, to manage the, the, the risk of climate change and such, while also extending the economic and social benefits of energy to everyone on the planet. This is an ambition that requires a change in the way energy is produced, used, and made accessible to, uh, 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 to more people uh, whilst drastically cutting emissions. Make no mistake, this transition is underway. Managing the transition is complex. All types of energy will be required to meet the needs of a growing population with rising living standards, as Eric also said, but that energy needs to be less carbon intensive if we're going to have a future. Energy is absolutely essential to the global economy, whether it's fuels or fertilizers or manufacturing or transportation. Energy 
enables the lifestyles that we all take for granted today. And access to reliable energy can transform lives and enables economic growth. But the thing is, 20% of the global population lives in OECD countries, and we consume 40% of the world's energy. In contrast, billions of people still lack access to energy that many of us take for granted. Modern, affordable energy for heating, lighting, cooking, refrigeration, and sanitation. Over the summer, I went to Madagascar for a holiday, and frankly, I saw that in spades uh, as I was driving around there. Shell believes in the, in the need for society as a whole to address climate change. We think a long-term goal for the world to achieve net zero emissions is challenging, but doable and necessary. But it will require urgent action and long-term vision from particularly policymakers to stimulate commercial and consumer opportunities. Shell will play its role, but it has to make commercial sense. So Shell's technical capacity, our customer perspective, operational experience, and market knowledge mean we're right at the forefront of many interesting new technologies and opportunities. Whether it's from deep water or digitalization, whether it's hydrogen electric, or whether it's carbon capture storage. And this is all underpinned by an absolutely relentless drive for safety and respect for the communities where we operate. In Latin America, I think, uh, as we can see, uh, you know, as, we, uh, as you drive around the city here, there's an absolutely growing middle-class population, and energy demand continues to grow. And just look on the chart, here's the evidence. Firstly, and gratifyingly, I think, poverty reached its lower to, lowest in recent years, and 96% of the population now has access to electricity, versus 76% in uh, 30 years ago. As the chart shows here, demand will grow by 80%. So energy demand will grow by 80% to 2040. And regional power will grow by a staggering 90% over that time. So there really is no question that demand will remain strong over the next two, two decades and, and beyond. But clearly, as I said, the energy mix needs to change going forward. So globally and regionally, the mix will shift towards renewables, unquestionably, but the overall outlook, as Eric also pointed out, remains dominated by hydrocarbons. This, of course, includes cleaner uh, natural gas. In Latin America, by 2040, although, although, as I said, electricity generation will be twice that of today, it will be produced from cleaner options. During the next two decades, it's expected that whilst hydropower and natural gas will still dominate, contribution from non-conventional renewables will also grow. When it comes to the energy transition, in many respects, uh, the world has a lot to learn from this region, and from Brazil in particular. Renewables are already responsible for something like 80% of power sector there, and so Brazil's starting point uh, is right out in front compared to many parts of the world. Clean energy is also important as part of our business in Brazil. We're in biofuels business through our joint venture with Ryzen, the largest manufacturer of ethanol from sugarcane in the country. Uh, Ryzen is Shell's largest investment in biofuels globally, in biofuels technology improvements, including reusing co-products co of sugarcane for secondary production of ethanol and power generation. The key point that needs to be stressed is that although a decrease in the share of fuel, oil, and coal is expected, certainly, there's still a need in the short, medium, and longer term to explore using traditional methods for both conventional and unconventional fossil fuels, which is, of course, why we are all here at this uh, conference today. So which brings us to what Shell Exploration is doing in Latin America to both leverage and support all of that. Shell has been around in uh, exploration, development, and commercialization of Latin America's energy needs um, for over a century, 100 years here in Argentina. And we aim to absolutely maintain a leadership position in the sector. We, we firmly believe that with the right mix of energy sources, and this includes conventional and unconventional oil and gas, uh, increasingly natural gas, and also newer sources as, such as biofuels, we can help meet the demand of existing and emerging markets in the region. Certainly, we will continue to produce oil and its related products to meet the needs and demands of the customers. But meeting that demand starts with a firm foundation of safe and ethical operations and is built on by a number of these lenses that I talk about. So firstly, world-class petroleum systems, technical excellence, development and technology capability, and ultimately, it's made possible and needs to be uh, made possible by stable fiscals and good uh, non-technical risk management from IOCs and other investors. 
So in the next few slides, I'm going to talk to some of that and use examples where this, these fundamental things are applied to our various businesses uh, in the region and strengthened by, by governments and uh, regulators alike. So starting with Mexico, uh, as it says there at the top on the left, a, a world-class petroleum system. So we, we choose to explore here because of the vast and uh, I think uh, untapped in many respects potential offered by multiple world-class petroleum systems in Mexico, in Brazil, and beyond. In Mexico, uh, I think based on 70 years of data and what we know from the US GOM, there's a prolific petroleum system not limited to the world-class Dithonian source rock. We know that because of the shallow water producing fields, which have frankly been outproducing the US GOM for uh, 30 years plus. In the deep water, which is grossly underexplored, we make inferences from what we see on the US side that the potential will likely parallel that of the, of the, you know, of the, of that to the north of the border. And as you can see from the seismic line here and from uh, the stratigraphic column, there are a multitude of play types that we'll be going for in uh, vast swathes of sort of, uh, of the offshore acreage there. So, variety of geological settings, carbonates, deep water turbidites, aeolian sands, and ranging, ranging in age from uh, you know, the Mesozoic all the way through to the, the young tertiary. So all of this together with our newly acquired licenses there, we have uh, a whole bunch that we picked up uh, last year, um, uh, offers a, a truly world-class opportunity. And uh, we've got people in the audience here who are busy working that up for hopefully drilling to commence uh, at the end of this year or early next year. Certainly a super exciting prospect ahead. Turning to technical excellence and uh, you know, the data and that, that goes with that, uh, obviously Brazil is super important for us. I think uh, it's clear, you know, the range of potential there that, we, that uh, is clearly seen. I mean, uh, everyone's identified that and uh, paid the appropriate signature bonus, etc. But with that does come considerable complexity. The Brazil pre-salt has delivered some of the highest productivity wells in deep water globally, with a few dozen wells producing above 30,000 barrels a day, and actually quite a few above 40,000 barrels a day, which is staggering that individual wells produce 40,000 barrels a day, uh, you know, day in, day out. But these fields that uh, do that are concentrated in the central outer high domain in the Santos Basin, with further exploration play upside both inboard and outboard from this proven play segment, but not yet, those bits, of course, haven't been proven yet. So I have to say, risk in those unproven segments is, is not insignificant and ranges from reservoir development and quality, integrity issues in the, in, uh, in the play there, presence of adequate outboard source kitchens, and actually a big CO2 risks uh, associated with post-salt volcanism, which I think nobody has yet managed to uh, you know, pinpoint uh, in great detail. We've got around uh, 400,000 barrels a day of equity production from uh, Petrobras operated fields at the moment in the pre-salt, but in recent years have built a, an attractive portfolio in all the play segments. Inboard, we have a Gato de Mato discovery where there's a tender for an FPSO ongoing as we speak, and we're currently completing an appraisal well there. And outboard, we've got a position in four exploration blocks, um, which we plan to test uh, actually later this year, imminently. So it, it's very interesting. I think in the next 18 months, we'll see the industry drill maybe a dozen wells uh, in the out, inboard and outboard play segments, including in the Campos Basin. And that'll certainly polarize risks and hopefully unlock an enormous amount of uh, future potential in this uh, world-class province. I'm pleased to say, and you know, I think it's a, a fantastic thing that Brazil is doing, but we, our, our knowledge is underpinned by you know, in-country research with really world-class institutions in both the academic and research space over there. Uh, there will be talks on Brazil later in the day, so if you're interested, uh, by, by all means, do attend them. In Bolivia, we have a different sort of business. Um, we, we're working in the Bolivia sub-Andean, and uh, you know, that uh, exemplifies technical excellence uh, in a very different sort of space. We drill complex high-pressure, high-temperature wells through you know, 6,000 plus meters of uh, overburden through multiple fault sli uh, thrust slices, uh, unfortunately often uh, many more than we thought were there originally. Um, and, and the technical excellence there, I suppose, is, uh, is based on a, a, on a truly multidisciplinary approach, an in integration of the subsurface using advanced seismic processing, um, non-seismic methods, sort of, sort of magnetotelluric, but also uh, something quite fundamental and different to many other places, you know, advanced structural modeling which uh, you know, is also shown in the picture there. Uh, all of this, believe me, is far from easy. And uh, you know, we have wells that uh, take uh, years, actually, to, to get down to the objective. So all of that, anyway, for, takes you know, the foundation of complex well design, 
you know, got all the extreme t temperature and pressure conditions having to deal with this. We have to push hard rock drilling right to its limit, you know, in terms of rig capacity and rig ability to, uh, you know, actually get down there. And we've got mo really major borehole stability and narrow drilling margin challenges. And adding to that complexity, you know, it is in the Andes, so we operate in extreme remote locations, and we have to dispatch huge rigs and heavy loads through mountainous and sinuous and uh, actually quite narrow tracks, which brings with it uh, enormous challenges. I'm really super pleased to say, again, to recognizing folks in the room here, that we've done all that uh, with uh, exemplary HSE track record and, uh, that of, and actually really good community relations, and that's a, a continuing foundation of what we do there. All right, continuing on, to, on a sort of technology trend, uh, we work in uh, Trinidad and Tobago where we have uh, a lot of NFE exploration potential adjacent to our uh, LNG um, plant there. And uh, that needs to continue to be unlocked with new technology. So I think as many other companies are doing, we're looking at OBN technology, RTM seismic processing, and that's getting uh, momentum across our whole portfolio actually, not just in Trinidad, all, all across the world. We're doing that in, uh, in Trinidad, and you can see uh, the seismic image, you know, the comparison of the sort of left-hand and right-hand pictures there. It's really quite impressive improvements uh, with uh, the new type of technology. And that's going to help us uh, delineate new prospects that we can drill uh, you know, on, a, on an ongoing basis to, uh, to feed the LNG terminal. Um, I have to say this, uh, this is underpinned by a strong push from the government to meet the increasing demand uh, in the growing population in Trinidad, but also the LNG export and downstream industries. And uh, all credit to the folk in the government there. They're, they're actively encouraging exploration uh, and uh, the ongoing business, which is also the case in Argentina. I think uh, Eric touched on that also before. Um, we, we've been around here for 100 years. We uh, you know, focused on the Vaca Muerta, which we're developing. But we're now also delighted to have picked up two deep water exploration blocks in the offshore earlier in the year. Um, I think this and the sort of uh, other IRC's participation across uh, the bid round is, has been made possible by the government's drive to become energy independent, relying less on imports from, from Bolivia and uh, LNG. So that's been, I think, manifested in uh, uh, attractive fiscals, completely commensurate with fiscal uh, with financial exploration, uh, extending those, those sort of um, uh, appropriate parameters to you know, good bid parameters which prioritize work program. And, and an appropriate time and scope in the primary exploration term with staged decision gates to, uh, to allow us to explore and uh, get after the full geological uh, understanding here. Additionally, I think super important, the ministry is also allowing free access to legacy uh, well and seismic data, which will promote investment as will uh, you know, the ongoing uh, acquisition of large multi-client surveys. Then something on markets. Uh, Obviously, the role of markets is absolutely fundamental to the, all the decisions that we make. In Latin America and everywhere in the world, natural gas will have a long-term part to play, as we just said before, in the transitioning energy system. And the region's strong e economic growth profile, combined with significant discovered reserves and undiscovered potential, presents opportunity and challenge in equal measure to governments, populations, and IOCs alike. I have to say, we are totally impressed by the region's governments and regulators' initiatives to facilitate gas market growth and integration, such as uh, gas market liberalization in Brazil. There, they've enabled our participation in the Malim Azul project, where we partner with Pat, uh, Patria Investment, Investimentos and Mitsubishi to construct and operate the Malim Azul uh, gas-powered thermoelectric power plant in Rio. That partnership also includes the sale of energy into the, uh, 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 in the Malim Azul project uh, and uh, into the regulated market that we've got there which is, has a link to the uh, pre-salt deep water gas production, where, and, and we have a 29% stake there. A portion of the power, power is also marketed by Shell Energy uh, Brazil business, which is a, our trading arm, which means that we are sort of investing across the whole value chain for, uh, for the gas there. We're already commercializing third-party cross-border gas with the sale of Argentinian gas from uh, Vaca Muerta into Chile, enabling Chile to take advantage of competitively priced gas from Argentina uh, whilst at the same time retaining their own supply security through their own uh, LNG import terminals. Argentina's Vaca Muerta is the second largest shale gas um, you know, uh, reserves in the world, and in the summer, Argentina has an excess of uh, natural gas, which provides export opportunities, and the country is already taking advantage of this through the development of uh, floating LNG gas liquefaction uh, projects, uh, in this case through YPF and XMA. We believe that as the uh, production increases, there'll be many more further opportunities to commercialize gas, both in Argentina and elsewhere in the region, 
and we see potential business op uh, opportunities throughout. Finally, uh, after historic success monetizing offshore gas supply through LNG in Trinidad, uh, the wider Caribbean and Central America also looking to take advantage of uh, competitive and affordable LNG, particularly in power generation in countries such as uh, Colombia. So this brings us full circle to the need for uh, exploration. I think uh, I've talked about all the sort of technical risks, but I do want to also focus on other challenges that we face. Firstly, uh, uh, and, and by the way, they're not uh, specific to uh, uh, Latin America, but you know, happen uh, pretty much globally, and in many cases, particularly in Western Europe. So we face activism across the globe. Uh, you know, it goes without saying, everybody is entitled to an opinion, everybody is entitled to express that. But as we've said before, we need to find the right balance between, on the one hand, uh, uh, the carbon uh, output, CO2 output, and on the other hand, the demand picture that uh, is right out there. So our purpose is to power progress together to provide more and cleaner energy solutions. So we work with environmental folks, we work with developmental organizations, and you know, working together, we reduce our environmental societal impact, uh, reduce uh, improved quality of land and water around our operations, and try, where possible, to benefit local communities as much as possible. A second uh, challenge, obviously, is a political instability and regulatory um, restriction. Both of these points are, you know, can cause very significant delays to a project, and uh, delay means money, and in some cases means uh, projects are simply not uh, economic anymore. So a stable government with straightforward regulations is clearly a preferred environment to do business. And finally, and I think very importantly, there's also the point about legacy. We've been around for 100 years. Uh, have we always got our operations right? Absolutely not. Does this impact our reputation? Absolutely does. As an industry, we need to take responsibility for our past actions, correct them, and then work with you know, local communities today to make sure that everybody benefits from those improvements. So what are we looking for? Uh, I think uh, as uh, in Latin America, but again, as everywhere else, um, we want to have a competitive business environment to encourage investment. So what that means is attractive fiscals, Transparency in the regulatory framework, effective environmental permitting processes, super important, often causing huge delays, effective community liaison, actually access to the resources, and then uh, where possible supply chain uh, incentives. So in summary, yeah, with the changing energy mix, I think uh, Latin America is absolutely well positioned for the future. Governments uh, tend to be receptive to investment and exploration remains absolutely key to growth. Shell is determined to continue to play its part across all elements of the value chain, focusing both renewable and traditional sorts of uh, oil and gas energy investments. And so uh, watch this space. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Uh, Ting Dawson from Equinor. Ting uh, has a BC in geology from the University of Kiel in Unicate and has uh, 39 years of experience in industry, worked for nearly 34 years for Estatoil, now Equinor. Ting started his career in the oil and gas industry in 1918 with an oil and gas service companies and worked for five years in South America and the Middle East. Tim joins Equinor's Exploration and Production Norwide unit in 1985. He has held various management positions within exploration, production, and technology and HR. From 2004 and 2008, a, he held the position in senior vice president for exploration in Norway, and in 2008, he was appointed as senior vice president for global exploration and Equinor business area for international operation. As of the 1st January in 2011, Tim leads the exploration business areas in Equinor as an executive service president and member of the corporate executive community. Equinor HSAs as of 15 May 2018. Please do.
one? Yeah, it looks like your name. I guess so. Remember, if you have questions for the speakers, you can either put them in on the app, the AAPG Events app, or you can uh, put up your hand and the volunteers will take you a piece of paper and you can write them on the piece of paper. And we'll pass them to the session chairs. Sorry, I decided a, I started a slideshow, so we're going to make you speak on cue. I apologize for that. Let's see. There we go. This one. I think you can move it. Yeah, you can just move with the arrows. Good morning, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here in. Uh, in uh, Buenos Aires, uh, not for the first time, and in, in fact, I was just reminded when um, when they read out my bio here that um, one of the first places um, I started to work was not actually here in Argentina, but uh, in one of one of your neighbouring countries, Paraguay. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, of working there for about 15 months, but also the pleasure of travelling a lot around Latin America, and uh, was here for the first time in uh, in, in 1981. Uh, I don't think at that point in time I could have envisaged that you know, almost 40 years later that uh, I'd be, be standing here and, uh, and, and addressing you, but uh, notwithstanding, it's a great pleasure to do so. Thanks to AEPG for the invitation, and, uh, and it's always a pleasure to, uh, to, to present and to participate on the panel with so many of my distinguished colleagues. I'm going to start somewhere, though, completely different, and uh, the picture in front of me is um, from probably one of our greatest uh, exploration success, or our greatest exploration success over the last, uh, last 10 years. Um, this is the, um, the field layout um, of the Johan Sverdrup uh, discovery um, offshore, offshore Norway, um, which is due to come on stream within, uh, within a few weeks. Uh, this discovery was made um, back in, in, in 2010. And it is kind of the dream field, if you like. It is uh, the, uh, a, field, there's some, a field of and for, for the future. Uh, and in fact, uh, the plan is that this field will, will produce uh, for the next, uh, next 50 years. Um, I decided to pull up this slide, you know, sort of, and you will understand the relevance, hopefully afterwards, as I go through my presentation, because I actually had the opportunity to travel out to this installation um, last week, uh, together with uh, senior executives from, 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 from YPF. And um, we're extremely proud of, uh, of this development for a number of reasons. Um, one, the, one of the reasons is that um, we are delivering this project uh, on schedule, potentially a little bit ahead of schedule. But we've actually reduced um, our investment on this field by about 40%. The original investment estimate for this was 123 billion uh, Norwegian kroner, about 14 billion uh, US. Uh, the latest estimate is 80 billion, so 43 billion kroner sa sa sort of saved in, this, uh, in the development uh, of, this, uh, of this field. It's a true supergiant. It's um, the sort of mean recoverable resources are about 2.7 billion barrels. You can do the math. That equates to about three to four barrels, uh, three to four dollars uh, in capex per barrel, and that is uh, pretty competitive, you know, sort of uh, in, in, in this day and age, if you like. Um, I was really surprised last week when they told me that the first phase production, which is expected to peak at around 440,000 barrels, will actually come from just eight production wells. Eight production wells. So you can do the math again, somewhere between 40 and 50,000 barrels a, a well. So this is, uh, this is um, it's just amazing. You know, the reservoir is fantastic. It's light oil. It's uh, shallow water depth. It's also extremely low carbon emissions. This um, field will be powered entirely by renewable electricity from shore. So there's a cable coming into there. And if you look at the platform on to, to, to your right on this, the, the big... Uh, sort of building on that, uh, the, the, the platform to the right is actually the, ex the, the, the electricity transformation unit actually taking it from, from, from AC to, to, to DC. 
Otherwise, what you see here is uh, from left to right is the, the living quarters. They're connected with a bridge, which can actually drive forklifts over to the, uh, the processing, uh, the processing uh, platform, again connected by, by another bridge to the, to, the, to the drilling platform, and then finally to the, uh, to the, the riser and utilities platform. Uh, the barge you can see in front there is a temporary feature with, um, for, for the extra manning. About Right now we have um, some about 950 people as we're doing the final commissioning of the platform before we start, start the production. Um, we expect that this field will um, generate about 100 billion US dollars you know, so to, uh, to the Norwegian state and society, and it will be a cornerstone asset for, for Equinor for many decades to come. The payback time at uh, current, uh, current oil prices is, is less than one year. Of course, it's uh, very early days, um, but we, have, we, we also hope to make if not similar or the same, but uh, you know, sort of high quality, uh, um, high quality, high value, low carbon discoveries here in Argentina, but I'll get back to that one. We're actually quite a newcomer to, to Argentina, but over the last three years, we've built quite a substantial before portfolio. But um, since we are a newcomer, I thought I'd spend just a, a, a few seconds on, on, on describing Equinor. So, um, this is, uh, this is us, as you like. You know, so we are actually one of the world's largest offshore operators. We have about 20,000 employees, and we have a presence in over, over 30 countries. We produce around 2.1 million barrels a day of oil equivalents, and now uh, 1.25 terawatts of uh, renewable electricity on, on an annual basis. Last year, our revenues were around about $80 billion. Our purpose is, like, uh, like my, my fellow colleague Isa, I imagine, to turn natural resources into energy for people and progress for society. And I'll repeat that. And I think this is an important message to you all, one which has been conveyed, you know, sort of, both by Eric and, uh, and, and Mark. Our purpose is to turn natural resources into energy for people and progress for society. Um, our strategy, our corporate strategy, can be summed up really in six words, uh, always safe, high value, and low carbon. International oil and gas will play an increasingly important role in our portfolio uh, of the future as legacy uh, oil and gas assets in Norway enter their late life phase. On the right-hand side, um, again, the sort of the three prongs of, uh, of, of our exploration strategy. Um, and we are, of course, tasked with delivering safely, you know, sort of high-value, low-carbon oil and gas resources to the company. Um, this has been the foundation on which uh, we enter into different bases, not least those here in Latin America. We target prolific basins like the Campos and the Santos uh, basins offshore Brazil and also the Vaca Muerta in, in Argentina, which, of course, there has been oil and gas, gas production for some hundred years already. We also access acreage at scale uh, in so-called frontier and emerging bases, like offshore Argentina, and also in other examples in Latin America, like Mexico, Nicaragua, and, uh, and Suriname. And the reason we do that is, of course, to be in position to capture eventual upside should we make a discovery. Um, on that basis, we get to test you know, high-impact opportunities, and uh, all of the companies represented here need actually to test and to find you know, sort of big hydrocarbon volumes simply because we produce an awful lot of oil and gas every day, every week, and every year. So what I want to do, and both, uh, both um, Eric and, and Mark have already gone to this, and maybe I'll just shorten, shorten down a little bit what I was intending to say about our views on energy perspectives, about the demand for, for, for oil and gas, and it would seem, you know, it could seem that uh, that Derek and I at least have colluded when it comes to, colluded when it comes to the, the slides we present. But uh, what I'm going to present to you is the results of our our yearly um, um, uh, corporate analysis of uh, of um, of global economy and uh, and uh, energy demand going going forward. So. Um, what is the need for new oil and gas investments? And I think uh, what, we can, what, what I can safely say here is that, so far at least, <laughs> we appear to be singing from the same hymn sheet. And, uh, yeah, and why wouldn't we? And we also have very similar views when it comes to, to the need for, for energy and uh, not least for the, uh, the, the need for oil and gas. And I think we can all agree, and then going back to our purpose statement, that energy 
is existential uh, for the well-being of our global population. And sometimes I wonder whether that message has got uh, lost in the global society at large. Um, so this report is really uh, builds on three different scenarios. I won't uh, sort of spend an awful lot of time on that, but um, basically what we look at is uh, situations where you know, um, the renewables you know, sort of um, continue to, 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 to grow, that we do uh, are in accordance with the, the two degree scenario from, 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 from Paris. But even in that case, and that is represented by the, uh, the lowermost point on the right hand chart out in 2050 here, in the light blue, you know, sort of we are um, postulating a need for 50 to 55 million barrels a day of, uh, of, uh, of, of oil production. And then let me remind you that if we go back from, where, from today, um, 50 years, that's exactly where we were. Um, global demand for oil uh, has grown more or less consistently at the 1 million barrels per day per, per year. Uh, and um, so far, you know, sort of there, there, there are no indications that, um, that the uh, de demand for, for oil has, has, has peaked. Um, basically, what we're saying here is that uh, um, irrespective of which scenario you believe in, um, then there is a gap. And if you look at the, closely at the numbers here on the slide, these numbers are very similar to the ones that uh, they're doing. It doesn't really matter whether it's 300 or 400 or 250 billion barrels uh, of, um, of, of gap, if you like, uh, up until 2040 or 50. It's, it is just a very big number. And so that you know, sort of if we don't, uh, um, if we don't um, invest, you know, sort of, uh, not just in existing fields and discoveries, but also into, into new resources, um, then we will potentially face a situation where we cannot satisfy demand going forward. I think I will just uh, push on to the next slide and um, talk about um, our exploration portfolio here in Latin America with focus then on, uh, on, on Brazil. And this slide looks pretty similar to the one that, uh, that Eric showed. That's not surprising. We're actually partnering on quite a number of the uh, opportunities in the pre-salt, especially in the... Uh, in the, in the Santos Basin and uh, will be participating in uh, some of the same very exciting wells going, going forward. Um, Equinor has a rather special position in uh, offshore Brazil. Um, we are the second largest operator when measured by production volumes to, to Petrobras. Uh, we operate the, uh, the, uh, the Peregrino field um, in, the, in the Santos Basin, that's a post salt field. And uh, back in 2016-17, uh, we actually acquired um, the Karkara asset from uh, Petrobras and, and, and took over the operatorship uh, there. Um, we're just in the process of uh, finalizing appraisal on the Karkara, Karkara field. And this again is like uh, our Johan Srader, if you like, in, uh, in, in Brazil. Uh, estimated the recoverable resources around about two and a half, two and a half billion barrels. We have 400, um, 400 million barrels in reserves in, in, in Brazil. And I think we can say that although you know, our first success didn't materialize until 2012 with the Pau de Suca discovery in the, the Campos Basin, you know, sort of it hasn't hindered us in building a very significant portfolio uh, since, since, since then. Like others, I think our access efforts were they were based on a very sound understanding of the fundamentals of the subsurface. Uh, uh, we spent you know, sort of a lot of time understanding you know, sort of plate scale regional models. Um, we theorized that, you know, sort of that reservoirs and petroleum systems on the Brazilian margin would also extend to, to, to Angola. Uh, Angola was a disappointing campaign for, for the entire industry, but it did test geological models and hypotheses and provided hard data uh, points uh, for us to calibrate and then bring back to Brazil um, when the opportunity set in the pre-salt in the Santos and Campos Basins opened up in 2017. So we were well positioned then. Um, as I said, we acquired um, the, uh, the, the car car asset from Petrobras, took over the, the operatorship. The Exxon subsequently uh, joined us there. Uh, it's now ourselves, Exxon and Galp, who are, are moving forward and are sort of uh, uh, and getting close to sort of the, the development phase on, on, on Karkara. Right now, um, 
uh, as we speak, um, we are re-entering um, the Guanjuma well on the same license. We made a discovery uh, there last year, uh, sort of yet to be uh, sort of determined whether that's commercial. We need to do a drill stem test, and that's the plan over the next, uh, next few weeks and, uh, and, and months. And as you can see, that we've continued to build quite a strong position in, uh, in, uh, in Brazil. And um, yeah, current estimates are you know, sort of that we have about 1 billion barrel risk uh, barrels of, of recoverable resources in, the, in this portfolio. Uh, 2017 was also the year we acquired our first assets in Argentina. And that was the, um, we farmed into the YPF operated Baco de Toro block in the northern part of the uh, Niken. Niken Basin. Um, although we only took our first position in Argentina in 2017, and as such, you know, we were a latecomer, um, we had, had a sort of strong belief in the subsurface, in the prolific Niken Basin uh, for quite some time, and we were also encouraged um, by the regional um, by the results of uh, detailed regional work which we did on both sides of the Atlantic when it comes to the offshore acreage in, in Argentina. Um, as I say, we are a latecomer, but um, I choose to believe that we're not too late, uh, neither when it comes to the, the further potential in the, in the Vacamuata and the Ikem Basin, or uh, uh, indeed the, uh, the offshore acreage. Uh, where we now have a 7-7 um, seven, seven block position. And as you probably saw last week, uh, we signed, exactly a week ago, we signed an agreement with the uh, YPF uh, to farm into their CAM 100, uh, 100 block on the sort of northern part of the Argentinian continental shelf and to take over the operatorship there. Um, I think when it comes to, to the to, to the Vacamata, I'm talking probably to the converted hair. I think you know, um, we recognized early on it had all the characteristics which you need for a successful unconventional play, not just the subsurface, but the fact that a lot of infrastructure was in place because of the legacy oil and gas industry. That also means that there was a lot of competence and expertise sort of really available. Um, other issues, we're all aware of those in, in Argentina, but uh, I like to say, you know, sort of exploration is a long game, oil and gas is a long day, uh, a, a long game, and uh, so we choose to, choose to believe this thing uh, long term about this. Um, and unconventionals, of course, they lend them well, you know, sort of to the cyclic nature of our industry, uh, where we can you know, sort of take our investments up and down to a much greater, we get, greater degree than we can with large offshore, offshore projects. Uh, since uh, the award of Bucket de Toro, we've uh, picked up some exploration acreage um, to, 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 to the east of that, and we're, we're looking to continue to build our position there. And of course, the Vacamuata is already turning out to be a significant success for, for Argentina, and, uh, and we truly believe you know, there's, there's, there's more to be had there. Our partnership with YPF and the Vacamuata is extremely important for us, and we're very pleased for this to, to grow, and we are now working together also uh, offshore. So as I said, when you come to the, to the offshore, this is, uh, this is our current position. Um, I talked already about the, uh, the uh, agreement which we signed last week. Again, it's an example of access at scale. This CAN 100 block it covers some 15,000 square kilometers of what we, I guess we can deem frontier acreage. I think it's important that we, we, we sort of manage our expectations when it comes to, to, to the offshore in Argentina. You know, sort of basically the deeper part of the continental shelf is... Uh, is not just underexplored, it's basically unex unexplored. But um, safe to say that uh, we and others, and we saw evidence of that in the concession round, uh, have identified a lot of acreage of interest. Uh, there are definitely big structures out there. Uh, the question mark is, of course, you know, whether we have a functioning hydrocarbon system, whether these are filled with, with oil, oil and gas. So I would, uh, on that note, I think I'll uh, end by, by complimenting the, um, the, the Argentinian uh, government and the authorities you know, sort of for conducting that offshore bid round in, in a very, very professional and, uh, and, uh, and, and transparent manner. Uh, we're not done yet by any means. Um, we need, of course, to, um, 
go through the necessary regulatory process and to secure permits for the offshore. We are breaking new ground when it comes to that in, 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 in Argentina. Uh, but uh, as a company and as a country, uh, both Equinor and Norway are more than willing to, to contribute, to share experiences from Norway as to how we have gone about that and uh, in order to, to conduct our, our operations in a safe and efficient manner. In sum, um, I would like to say that, you know, probably as you can see, that uh, Latin America has become one of the most important uh, exploration re and production regions for, for, for Equinor. Um, we've built a very significant um, exploration position, both offshore uh, Brazil and Argentina, the last two to three years. And we're very excited by the potential to make high impact uh, discoveries onshore. In the back of the Toro uh, block, we are encouraged by the results of the, the first two, two wells and look forward to developing that uh, asset further with the operator YPF. With that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Finally, I'd like to introduce Ms. Emmanuel Jarnet from Total. Excuse me. Uh, Emmanuel has a master's degree from the Geological Engineer School of Nancy, France, as well as a master's degree in geophysics from the IFP School in Paris. She has 22 years for experience in oil and gas in industry, mostly in exploration domain. She began her career with ELF, and after the merger of ELF and Total, she moved to Angola, where she had an activity role in the major oil discovery from offshore block 32. Emmanuel held several managerial positions with Total, first as head of the geophysical department, then a Gabon exploration manager, and then as a manager of the Geoscience Group working in support of Total Nigerian subsidiary. In 2015, she uh, then taught a transversal position in the nearly creative exploration excellent team in France, which allowed her to provide support to Total exploration teams worldwide. In 2017, Emmanuel was promoted to the role of area exploration manager Bust in Houston and is in the charge of lending total exploration activity in South America. Please, Emma. Sorry, I can't find the cursor. <laughs> Got lost. Did the light? Thank you. Can you see it? See it here. Is there someone from AV that could help us, please? Audiovisuales, por favor. Que se perdió el. So good morning. Thank you, Victor and Carlos. It's my pleasure to be able to talk to you about total exploration perspective on exploration. So unfortunately, our SVP exploration, uh, Kevin McLachlan, uh, could not make it to the conference today. He apologized. He would have liked to be with you. But uh, I will be giving the talk uh, on his behalf. So I will share insight on the first the, challenge, the challenges and opportunities that uh, we are facing in a global energy trend. And uh, secondly, on our exploration strategy with a special focus on uh, South America. 
So first, this slide is about uh, total group ambition as a responsible energy major. Total's motto of committed to better energy is a result of our conviction that the global energy balance of tomorrow will be the result of a long transition during which the renewable energies will develop in addition to conventional resources. So this transition will require major technological changes, a lot of innovation and investment needs. So Total already devotes a large part of its uh, investments in uh, lower carbon resources. We are present in the solar, in the wind, uh, all these kind of renewable energies and we are promoting sustainable biofuels. So Total is gradually adapting its global strategy and wants to be a positive player to tackle the climate challenges. So we do, however, remain an oil and gas company. And we believe that despite the growth in demand for renewable energy, the world will still be dependent on oil and gas for a major part of its projected energy needs in 2040. In the sustainable development scenario from International Energy Agency, which is the two degree scenario, we keep more or less the same energy demand in 2040 as in 2016. And even in this rupture scenario, there is still a need for oil and gas for at least 50% of the energy mix, 14% being from yet to find, meaning exploration. So from a long-term perspective, industry needs oil and gas exploration investments. And some recent work from, uh, work from uh, Wood Mackenzie shows that the need for exploration contribution to global production could come as early as 2025. So total exploration strategy is uh, fully integrated into our corporate 20 years ambition. Exploration success is a key part of our long-term plan. We know, we know it takes time, um, it takes perseverance, conviction, technical and commercial focus to be successful. And we are very committed to all of these aspects. Looking at our strategy, um, we reset our exploration strategy in 2015 and we collectively built an exploration performance improvement plan to build from our strengths and to address our needed improvement areas. Our exploration strategy is to focus primarily in places that we believe have, this, have a strong yet to find and value creation potential. Our global exploration portfolio represents more than 10 billion barrels of oil equivalent of risk potential. And through our exploration program, we aim to add more than 600 million barrels of oil equivalent of future reserves annually and on average by drilling at least 25 years with 25 exploration wells per year. We are spending $1.3 billion on exploration and appraisal with a target to deliver results with a competitive finding cost of less than $2 per barrel of oil equivalent. We have built a robust um, portfolio analysis approach to select and uh, balance our drilling uh, program capital by risk related to the maturity of the basin and the play. So we invest the majority of the drilling capital in emerging and proven plays, as we expect them to be lower risk but still material. Second, we are continuing to invest 15% of our capital in frontier prospects to open up new plays. And this is a crucial part of our investment um, strategy for, for growth. And th third, we retain the remaining 35% of the capital for mature and nearby uh, exploration, which is mainly dedicated to maximizing the value of our producing assets. So in this context, we are also giving priority to the best rank prospects, uh, which include the lower cost project opportunities. So we believe that this uh, strategy will drive us to our, our goal, which is to deliver leading exploration performance. Now we are going to look at our performance, look back and our, our program, short-term program. So following all of this uh, hard work, uh, we have been enjoying some exciting times in the past years uh, with some impact, impactful and material discoveries. You can see here a map with the exploration core areas for Total, where we mainly focus our exploration activities. 
We have highlighted some of our key discoveries of the past years, the past three years, both with some of our key wells for the remaining 2019 and 2020 program. So talking about discoveries uh, in the major basin, for example, I can mention the Glendronach uh, exploration well in the west of Shetland, which is a significant gas discovery. It's located nearby to our facilities, so the resource can be put on stream in the very short term. In an emerging basin, basin I can mention the very interesting Ballymore discovery in the Gulf of Mexico, operated by Chevron. It's a discovery in the North Let Play, and it extended the previous successes further to the west and, uh, and deeper than uh, previously proven. The well encountered an outstanding quality and thick North Let Reservoir with essentially 100% net to growth and 200 meters of uh, net oil pay and an oil dome too. And we are working with Chevron to fast track a development plan. In the frontier basin where the petroleum system is unproven, we have the recent Brulpada discovery in South Africa. This is a one billion barrel of oil equivalent gas and condensate discovery, so it's important. The challenge there will be the marketing, that there is no infrastructure for gas yet, but still it's a good news for South Africa, as it's uh, certainly opening something big for the, in the future for this country. And we have a second uh, exploration well planned shortly in the license. Finally, I can also mention the recent GTRO discovery in the Guyana, which was announced by the operator Tulo um, earlier this month. The well found high quality oil bearing sandstone reservoir with 55 meters of net oil pay. And uh, hopefully this well will be followed by uh, other discoveries in the, in the license. So looking at our short term exploration program, it's a balanced uh, program in line with our investment strategy, having wells in all uh, our basin focus area. And in particular, we will have a close look at the wells in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Guyana Basin, many wells coming there, or in the West African coast and the Mediterranean Sea. So this is a strong pro program ahead of us for which we have a high expectation. Talking about new venture acreage, um, so we, we performed a sustained effort to capture new acreage over the, over the past three years. We have rebuilt our prospect inventory and added over 5.5 billion barrel of oil equivalent risk potential. We have worked uh, hand in hand with the business development team to successfully rejuvenate our portfolio. So this leads to total having the highest net acreage uh, amongst our peers. And this is mainly deep water, which is our area of strength. But we do pay careful attention where we invest. We want to capture profitable acreage where the fiscal terms are attractive and where we have expertise. Our goal in New Venture was also to exploit the downturn and to capture at lower cost. Now we're gonna focus on, uh, on uh, Latin and South America. Total has an historical presence in exploration over most of the countries of the continent. We eventually entered and then exited uh, some countries and sometimes entered back. So it's a perpetual uh, movement of opportunities. The earliest presence of the group was in uh, Venezuela in 1958 in Lake Maracaibo. And the latest entries were Mexico in 2016 and the Guyana in 2018. So Total was present in the Guyana in the, in the 90s and then left and fortunately came back in this uh, prolific basin. Our strengths in the area are an historical knowledge, um, the diversified portfolio from frontier to major basin, and the alliances with key partners such as uh, YPF in Argentina, Petrobras in Brazil, or YPFB in Bolivia, and uh, many others. The challenges that we face are high competition for acreage capture, sometimes long permitting and environmental processes. The fiscal terms may also be a limiting factor, as well as a high break-even price of, the, of some challenging projects. 
This, however, remains a key continent for Total, and we do want to pursue these uh, success stories. I will now focus on two of our historical countries, uh, first Argentina and then uh, Brazil. So Total has been present in Argentina since uh, 1978. We have acreage in the Nequin Basin, in the, in the Austral Basin, in the Malvinas, and the North Argentine Basin. So focusing on the, on the Neocon Basin, we hold uh, four operated and six non-operated licenses. And <clears throat> the ongoing pilot programs are confirming the Vaca Muerta to be a world-class giant shell play with outstanding reservoir characteristics and very high deliverability. So the play is extending laterally, but also vertically, with multi-layers uh, being developed. So we have, been, uh, we have had success uh, with all three phases, and it's leading to very impressive discovered resources of more than 3 billion barrels of oil equivalent. Then with the excellent results obtained from the development pilots, uh, we have sanctioned our first full field development with Aguada Pichana phase one. We have plans to drill between 10 and 20 wells per year, depending on market condition. So besides this neoquen activity, Total has recently into, entered into three new exploration uh, permits offshore, one permit in the Madrinas Basin and two permits in the Northern Argentine Basin, where we will, uh, we will perform 2D and 3D uh, acquisitions. So we are very excited to be in these new plays and in this uh, renewed uh, adventure for offshore Argentina. Then let's focus on, on Brazil, where we have been uh, present in Brazil since 1975. We are producing about 20,000 barrels per day, which will increase to 100,000 barrels per day in 2022. We have invested $5 billion to date in exploration and production, and this effort will be maintained as we plan on investing around one billion US dollar overall per year. The pre-salt in uh, Santos Basin uh, is the main play we are developing by now. This is the case for Lapa, uh, where we were the first IOC to operate a producing field in uh, Brazilian pre-salt. And we are partner uh, on the giant Meru field with an early production of 40,000 barrels per day and with two FPSO already approved. And on Yara field, the production is expected to start by year end. In parallel to these uh, development acti activities, we've got 14 exploration licenses, six being operated. So uh, we have one well ongoing, the Gato de Mato 3 appraisal well being drilled by Shell. And we will also have a close look at the pre-salt Monai well to be drilled in Espirito Santos Basin in 2020 by Petrobras with Total and Equinor as partner. So to close, I would like to leave you with a few messages um, stating what we believe are the key for successes. Our exploration motto is to be the leader in exploration performance thanks to our team passion, creativity, and technical excellence. So we, first, we believe the results are the fruit of our people performance and organization. We are now organized in uh, regional hubs, which has improved our ability to, to focus our studies in key sedimentary basins. Second, our exploration strategy to achieve our ambition is efficient. We have built, and balance, uh, we have built a, a balanced portfolio, following a lot of new venture work with captures at a relatively low cost while maintaining the capital discipline of our exploration spending, as we are also selecting the most profitable and value-creative uh, uh, prospects. And third, this, is, we, this will only be sustainable if we are able to build strong alliances with our partners. Our approach is to find in each of our basins of interest the best partners to share common vision and value creation, building a common knowledge. And fourth and last, uh, we are all now working in a data and innovation exciting world where digitalization is promising lots of changes and revolutions, and we are part of it. So we have been working on major digital transformation in Total Group. 
and in exploration. So we are partners with, uh, with Google for some promising project, and we are already implementing latest innovation in our assets for better and quicker data interpretation. And in the meantime, innovation and research and development is bringing us future, future technologies. I can mention our METIS project uh, on, for onshore seismic acquisition with drones, uh, which are showing realistic industrialization following pilots in the foothills of Papua New Guinea and in the Emirates. And the NG offshore, we are developing the marine uh, vibrator technology, which will, will uh, also allow more eco-friendly options for offshore seismic acquisitions, less invasive for the environment. So that's it for me. I'd like to thank you for your, your attention, and muchas gracias a todos. Hello. Yeah, I think that's working. Okay, thanks uh, to all the presenters. Uh, we, we only have uh, time for a couple of questions. Uh, we have to go to the next uh, activity, which is the luncheon. So when I start, uh, so the question is gonna be to all the panel. First one will start from here to there, then the second one will start from the, from the other side. So one of the questions that came from the, from the audience was, uh, do, uh, do any, energy supply demand projections internally developed by, by EIA or, or sorry, internally developed or EIA base, take into account the possibility of global carbon pricing or taxes, and, and if that is the case, how would the, that have an effect on the oil and gas industry? So Eric, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I can't speak to all of them. I know for certain our, the ExxonMobil outlook includes a carbon tax assumption in it. I, I think it's $40, but you'd be able to see that online. I, I'm pretty sure most of these forecasts assume some type of government carbon tax or carbon tax equivalent um, ro rolling into them. Mark, any, any thoughts or any additional comments from anybody else, Tim or Emmanuel? No, I, can, I can comment on that as well. It's, um, our assumptions in, include the um, uh, carbon tax assumptions as well across the portfolio. Um, we're already paying carbon taxes in, in, in Norway, and um, when we make our, do our evaluations and make our investment decisions, then we assume, we assume a, a, a carbon tax in those, uh, in those uh, decision bases. Okay, thank you. The other one that came um, from the public was, uh, what, if any, would be the effect uh, of the oil, oil, uh, low oil prices on deep water projects, especially in Latin America? So anybody of you want to take a stab on that? Well, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be a big effect. Go, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> okay. No, that's, that's right. That's, uh, the uh, price of oil is very volatile. And we have seen in recent uh, months that it can go quite high and then go down. So it's very difficult to plan or project and to invest at one time when we don't know what will be the, the oil price in, in the long term. So that's why we need really to be careful in our investment, in the project that we select. We need to, to, to work to, to, to have low break-even prices for our project and, and really look at the OPEX to try to reduce our OPEX as much as we can to, to adapt and to be resilient for a lower oil price in the future. Eric, anything else? To add? Excellent answer. The only thing I would add is that it's, it, the uh, recovery, the Perwell recovery is a big driver in, in these deep water developments, so it sort of depends on the geology, mm. and then you, you've got to have favorable fiscals, otherwise the project got shut down. One, one that came, and also on the public today, but also was discussed yesterday with several of the young professionals and the students that were in the young professionals reception was about the role of geoscientists in the future, as, as we start talking about the world uh, going into into a focus on energy matrix and then balancing that between the conventional oil and gas and the emphasis on renewables and alternative energy. So what are your thoughts on the role of the geoscientists in that world and any, any kind of thoughts and, and uh, advice to the younger uh, professionals and the, and the students? Uh, 
So I don't know who wants to take on that one. So I can st take a stab at that. So uh, first and foremost, I think all of us show that oil and gas will be around for a, a good while yet. You know, so I don't think that there's any, there's any significant risk of, uh, you know, of a, a lack of employment opportunities for geologists and geophysicists. I think uh, actually to the contrary, depending on uh, which part of the world you're looking at, but certainly uh, Tim and I are heavily involved in, in from, from a European perspective, where we're seeing numbers of people studying geology at universities plummeting. And then on top of that, uh, a lot of the folk coming out of universities not particularly wanting to work for oil and gas companies. So, you know, uh, I think from a European perspective, there's increasing concern, I think, that actually the trouble will be not having sufficient people to uh, fulfill the, you know, the, the needs of the industry going forward. Of course, it has to be said that I think the converse is that in the US and, and you know, Brazil and uh, other parts of the world, there are a lot of folk that are coming to universities and uh, wanted to come into the industry. So I think there's, a, there's potentially a changing demographic in there. But overall, I would say that there isn't uh, a significant risk. And uh, I think Tim and I are also uh, at the forefront of trying to get the messaging balanced out there so that people understand, just as we've been saying today, that there's a future out there and that you know, geologists, should, we need geologists and people should be unafraid to go and study at universities because there will be careers for the longer term. Tim or Emmanuel or anybody in Emmanuel? Well, I can just complement the, the, the answer. If, if the question is about the role of geoscientists, I think the role will still be the same. It's to understand the subsurface, to understand the techno technonics and the, the, the stratigraphy and the, to understand the deposition of rocks and the migration and the type, type of fluids. So the role will, will stay the same. The question is, is, is there a need? Uh, for, for how many geosciences will be needed in the, in the future. And uh, so as, uh, as we discussed, uh, yes, in a, in a medium term, there is still a need for, for geoscientists because there is still need for oil and gas, even in the, in the rupture scenario. And I just want to mention that uh, 25 years ago, when I was a student, I was really hesitating, shall I, shall I go into the geosciences? Shall I do, go into exploration? Is there a future for exploration? I was asking this question. And one of my teachers said, follow your passion. If your passion is there, follow it, and you will find your way. So that's the advice I would give to the, to the youngest. Can I say one other thing? So it's a question that comes up in pretty much every forum, uh, you know, particularly with youngsters around. The other question, part B, if you like, is the digital thing. And right. It was touched there. You know, everything's going to be done by artificial intelligence. Woe's me. Do I ever, ever have a role in, t in terms of interpreting seismic in the future? Well, we all have ambitions in digital, but before we can you know, sort of fully replace a, a human explorer, I think we've got uh, decades and decades for that as well. You know? We will need a lot more people, I think, and digital scientists and that sort of thing to, to help in that space. Thank you. Any closing thoughts from anybody from the panel? No? OK. Uh, I would like to, again, on behalf of uh, APG, of Carlos, and myself, uh, thank you. I think uh, from, from Eric's perspective, uh, perspective on a summary note, uh, you know, an interesting presentation. Uh, uh, obviously, lots of success, uh, especially in Guyana, an interesting development for you guys. Um, and then also, as you said, the, 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 it's, it's a long-term game, and you have to always uh, keep that in mind and keep investing, right? And then. Not, uh, not just uh, focus on one success, but keep the momentum and you show us some of the key uh, considerations that you guys are taking into account. And then in terms of the energy demand also, an interesting thought about you know, how this whole plays, uh, pl how all of this plays in, into that. Then from Chell, I think Mark gave us a good uh, overview of, of the challenge, but also the, the, how Latin America fits within that challenge and also uh, the marketing perspective, which is the market's perspective, which is important also to understand, and then some of the challenges, right? So you mentioned some of the NGOs, uh, activism, the political stability or instability and, and other things. And then I think uh, uh, Tim from Equinor showed us uh, an impressive uh, development uh, for them in, in the North Sea and how they have been able to, to optimize the cost in such a way that you are making this uh, a very attractive project and and how that uh, is, is going to be done with a limited number of wells, uh, which is pretty impressive with the numbers that you share. Uh, and then your, your increased presence in, in Latin America and your recent uh, activities in, in Argentina in particular. And then total, at the end, uh, Emmanuel, I think you showed us your 20-year your ambition. 
uh, kind of like the updated uh, exploration plan that, that you put into place uh, at 2015, and then um, interesting mix that you put in there of 50% core and emerging, 35% uh, for the mature, and then 15% from the frontier. And then some of your activities, um, uh, upcoming activities discoveries, but also the amount of uh, acreage position that you have added and, and the prospective volumes. So again, uh, thank you very much uh, to, to all the presenters, to all the participants. We have uh, now, go we are going now to our next activity, which is the special luncheon by Scott Tinker. And then there will be uh, sessions starting, I think, at 1.55, if I remember correct. Thank you very much. Might as well. Huh? Yes.